Hi, I'm Forrest from Two Bats Gaming and welcome to our how to play of Ghost Stories. Ghost Stories is a notoriously tough co-op game in which one to four players take on the roles of a team of Taoist monks tasked with defending their village from a horde of supernatural baddies. Please note that this is only a how to play video of Ghost Stories. If you're interested in our thoughts and opinions of the game, please check out our review available in the upper right hand corner or also in the video description. Okay, let's dive in. A quick note, this how-to is arranged around the four-player initiation difficulty configuration of the game. If playing with less players, some changes will be made and set up in play order. However, the majority of the game remains the same, so we recommend you watch the explanation first. We'll cover setup and rules changes for less players after the gameplay explanation. Begin by randomly arranging the Nide Village tiles in a 3x3 square. Note that the tiles are double-sided. The bright-colored side with the visible villager is the one we will be using. The dark-colored side represents a haunted tile. We'll explain this further in the gameplay section. Next, arrange the four player boards adjacent to the village grid, with one facing each player. The player boards are also double-sided, each side representing a specific special power that the player can employ during the game. Randomly assign a color to each player, as well as which side of the board he or she will use. Now place the two Buddha figurines on the village temple tile and the player figurines on the center tile. Next, each player receives the following. Four Chi tokens. These represent the hit points of each player, run out, and your character dies. One Dao token in his or her color, and one black colored Dao token. These tokens are used to modify dice rolls when attacking ghosts. Again, more on this in the gameplay section. One Ying Yang token in his or her color. These are used to perform certain special actions. More on this later. Finally, we'll arrange the game deck. Shuffle the 55 blue ghost cards and set 10 aside face down. Next, randomly select one of the 10 orange Wu Fang cards, again, no peeking, and set it on top of the previously formed pile of 10 ghost cards. Then place the remaining 45 ghost cards on top of this pile. We're now ready to play the game. A player's turn is composed of two phases, the Yin phase and the Yang phase. During the Yin phase, three things will occur. First, any ghost on the active player's board will trigger their abilities. More on this in a minute. Second, if a player's board is overrun by ghost, he or she loses one chi token. This won't be an issue until further in the game, so we'll cover it there. Third, the player will draw a ghost card and place it into play. For the first player's turn, there are no ghosts currently in play, so we ignore the first two parts of the yin phase, and the first player's turn will consist solely of drawing a ghost card. So let's say it's the red player's turn. She'll begin by drawing a ghost card. Once the ghost is drawn, she must place the ghost on a player board according to the following rules. A red, yellow, green, or blue ghost must be placed on the board of the corresponding color, if possible. A black ghost must be placed on the active player's board, again only if possible. In the case that all three of the applicable spaces on a board are already occupied, the active player chooses any other unoccupied location. Should all available 12 ghost locations be filled, the active player does not draw a new ghost, instead they lose one chi token. Ghosts have a variety of associated actions with their placements, presence, and removal from the board. These are represented by a set of up to three symbols on a ghost card. The left symbol is applied only upon the placement of a ghost. In other words, it only occurs when the ghost comes into play. The middle symbol is applied on each turn of the player whose board is occupied by said ghost. For instance, on the blue player's turn, all center symbols of ghost on her board will be triggered. The right symbol is applied when the ghost is defeated and removed from play. Not every ghost will have a full set of symbols. For instance, certain ghosts may only have an effect when they are destroyed. Anyways, back to the red player. She draws the topmost ghost card, and she has received the blood drinker. So let's check this ghost out. First off, it's a red ghost, so it must be placed on the red player's board in a spot of her choosing. She'll place it here in the middle. Now let's look at the blood drinker's symbols. There's no left symbol, so nothing happens when it comes into play. There's also no middle symbol, so the ghost has no ability that will trigger on each of the red player's turns. However, it does have a symbol on the right, which means an effect will trigger when the ghost is defeated. We'll check this out in a second. Now that a ghost has been placed, we go into the second phase of the red player's turn, the yang phase. This is where the player will take on the role of his or her Taoist monk. A player's yang phase occurs in the following order. First off is movement. A player may move her figurine from its current tile to an adjacent tile. Diagonal movement is not allowed. Also, the movement phase is optional. A player may choose to stay where they are. 
In this case, our red player will choose to move here. After movement comes the second part of the Yang phase. A player may choose one of the two following actions. One, request help from a villager, or two, attempt an exorcism. So first we have requesting help from a villager. As noted before, each village tile has an associated special power that it can provide to the players. A player may only activate the special power of a tile that they are currently standing on. In this case, our red player is currently on the sorcerer's hut, which would allow her to instantly destroy any ghost in play while disregarding any effects that would take upon that ghost's removal. In other words, ignoring the rightmost ghost card symbol. However, this ability comes with the cost of one chi token. Simply put, pay a hit point to kill a ghost. Now our red player knows that in ghost stories, your chi is precious and should be guarded, so she'll forgo requesting help from the current village tile on this turn. Instead, she chooses to attempt an exorcism. She's going to try to destroy the ghost on her board. To attempt an exorcism, a player must be adjacent to the ghost they are attempting to destroy. Corner spots have some additional rules, we'll cover these in a minute. In order to defeat a ghost, you must roll enough of the associated colors to meet or exceed a ghost resistance, which is in the upper left hand corner of each ghost card. So our player rolls the three Dao dice. In this case, our player has rolled two red and one green die. Awesome, she's got enough and the ghost is exercised. However, not all is well. Remember that certain ghosts may have an effect that triggers when they are destroyed. Sometimes this can be a reward and sometimes it can be an obstacle. In the case of the blood drinker, we had the latter. This symbol means that the player who destroyed the ghost must roll the cursed die. Now the cursed die is nasty. The best result you can hope for is no effect at all. So red player rolls the cursed die and gets this symbol, which means that she loses one chi token. Ouch. This stinks, but such is the way of ghost stories. And that ends the red player's turn. Now let's move on to the green player. He begins with the end phase. No ghost on his board, so he'll draw a ghost card. Looks like he's drawing the fallen monk. It's green, so it goes on his board. And this ghost has an effect that occurs when it's brought into play. In this case, the active player must draw another ghost card and place it. So green draws another ghost, and we have the ooze devil, a nasty blue ghost. Since it's blue, it must be placed on the blue player's board. Keep in mind that we still need to apply any abilities of the ooze devil. Just because the ghost isn't placed on the active player's board doesn't mean we ignore its effects. In this case, the Ooze Devil has one of the most important effects in the game, and that is the Haunter ability. When a ghost with the Haunter ability comes into place, you will place a Haunter figurine on top of that ghost card on the player's board. And yes, I know this is a bit confusing as the symbol is in the middle of the card. We'll go into this in a moment when we arrive at the blue player. For right now, just know that when you see the Haunter symbol, you'll bring a Haunter figurine into play on top of that ghost card. So that finishes the green player's yin phase. Now on to the yang phase. In this case, the green player is going to stay put and request help from his current village tile. He's at the herbalist shop, which allows him to roll two dice and take Dao tokens of the corresponding color results. He rolls a red and a white die. Now white die faces represent a wild roll. You may use them for any color result whatsoever. So he takes a red and a blue Dao token. About Dao tokens, when attempting to exercise a ghost, you may use any amount of Dao tokens to add a colored die result to your final roll. Here's an example. Let's say you're facing the hopping vampire and you roll one yellow die and two red. If you had them, you could use two yellow Dao tokens to add to the final result and destroy the vampire. Also an important rule about Dao tokens, players occupying the same tile may share and use each other's Dao tokens as though they were his or her own. So back to the game. Since our green player chose to request help from his tile, he may not attempt an exorcism this turn. However, he's not done yet. He decides that he'd like to use his yin yang token. A player may use this token in addition to their normal yang phase action during their turn. Using a yin yang token allows a player to choose one of two options. Either they can get help from any village tile without having to be on that tile, or they can turn a haunted village tile back to its normal active unhaunted side. Once used, the yin yang token is discarded. However, it may be regained as a reward for killing certain ghosts. Also, keep in mind that using the token is in addition to a player's normal action. For instance, you could use the yin yang to request help and then attempt an exorcism as normal. Secondly, it is possible to use a yin yang twice in one turn. For example, you use it before attempting an exorcism. During your exorcism, you destroy a ghost that has the yin yang token reward, and then you can use the token again on that turn. Useful stuff, don't forget about it. So our green player is going to use the yin yang token to request help from a villager. In this case, he's going with the Pavilion of the Heavenly Winds, which allows him to move a ghost of his choice to any free space, then move another player's figurine to any village tile. 
So first, he'll move the Fallen Monk here to the third spot on his board. Next, he'll move the Blue Player's figurine to this tile. This concludes the Green Player's turn. Now we come to the Blue Player's Yin phase. First, any ghost on his board will trigger their central symbol. So remember our friend the Ooze Devil and how he summoned the Haunter figurine? Well, that brings us to an important game concept, how Haunters work. Haunters pose one of the biggest threats in ghost stories. While a Haunter figurine is occupying the same spot as a ghost card with the Haunter symbol, the figurine will move forward on the Yin phase of the player who owns that board. There are three spots on each lane that a Haunter can occupy. One on the card, one above the card, and one adjacent to the village tile. The figurine moves forward at the rate of one spot per turn. For the first two spots, there's no effect. However, when the Haunter reaches the third space, the corresponding village tile in front of the spot will become haunted. You flip a tile over to its dark side to represent this. If the first tile in front of the Haunter is already haunted, you flip over the next in line. Now here's why haunting sucks. When a tile is haunted, you may not use its associated power by requesting help. Also, if at any time three of the village tiles are haunted, you immediately lose the game. Also keep in mind that when a haunter haunts a village tile, their figurine immediately goes back to its starting spot on the ghost card. In other words, unless the haunter ghost is defeated, it will haunt a village tile every two turns. Also, if a haunter ghost is defeated and another ghost without the haunter ability is put into his previous space, the figurine will not move during that player's turn. A ghost with the haunting ability must be present in order for the figurine to move. Back to the blue player's yin phase, second part. Check for overrun board. In this case, nope, so nothing happens. So the final part of the yin phase, draw a ghost. And what do you know? We drew the hopping vampire. It goes onto the yellow player's board, and since it's a haunter, we bring another figurine into play. Now onto the blue player's yang phase. So let's cover an important topic, each player's special power. As we discussed before, each player board brings a special power that they can use each turn. The blue player currently has the Heavenly Gust power, which allows her to request a village tile's help and attempt an exorcism in the same turn in any order. So she'll move into this corner, which is the Buddhist temple, and first request help from the villager. The Buddhist temple allows you to take a Buddha figurine and place it at the end of your next Yang phase on the following turn. Buddha figurines are essentially traps for upcoming ghosts. You may place a Buddha figurine on the empty ghost spot of any board your figurine is currently facing. When a ghost is placed onto a space currently occupied by a Buddha, it is immediately destroyed without triggering any of its effects and the Buddha figurine returns to the temple tile. Now the blue player will attempt an exorcism, which she can do thanks to her special power. As mentioned before, corner tiles are a special case. When attempting an exorcism in a corner tile, you may split the results of your roll among the two ghosts. So the blue player rolls, and she gets two blue and one green. Okay, the one green takes care of the fallen monk, but she's lacking one blue. But wait, she's got a blue Dao token, so she'll discard it and use it to increase her remaining result to three blue, which kills the ooze devil. Awesome. Neither of these ghosts has a removal effect, so it's the next player's turn. Now finally, the yellow player. First up is the yin phase. So, ghost abilities. Here we have another haunter, so we'll move the figurine up. Next is the board overrun. Nope, so let's move on. Third, we draw a ghost card. And yellow draws the severed heads. Ouch, that looks like it hurts. Black ghost must go on your own player board if possible, so he'll drop it here. These heads have a particularly nasty summoning effect. You use one less die when attempting exorcisms, and you must also draw an additional ghost card. So let's do that, and we get the Black Widow, an even nastier black theme ghost. Again, it goes onto the yellow player's board. The Black Widow prevents all players from using Dow tokens to modify their roll results, which we can remember by using the inactive Dow marker. Told you Ghost Stories was a mean game. From here, the yellow player's turn would proceed with the Yang phase, and he would choose to request help or attempt exorcisms as he saw fit. Let's move on as we pretty much covered the basics. So as play continues, you will be dealing with additional ghosts you draw each turn and attempting to defeat them to keep the player boards clear, as well as avoiding haunting your village tiles. One important note, if a player's board is completely filled with ghosts during their yin phase, they do not draw an additional ghost card. Instead, they lose one chi token. Should a player lose all of his or her chi tokens, they immediately die and their figure is placed laying down onto the graveyard tile. They lose all of their current inventory, Dao tokens, yin yangs, any Buddhas, and so forth. All of the ghosts on his or her board still remain in play. 
However, not all is lost. They may still participate and discuss choices in the game, but may take no direct action unless the following happens. Other players may resurrect dead Dallas by using the special power of the graveyard tile. So, just because you're down doesn't mean you're out, as long as you can get some help from the living. Now let's move on to how you win or lose. First off, since this is Ghost Stories, which is notoriously difficult, we'll cover how you can lose. There's three ways. First, if all players die and are placed into the graveyard, the game ends immediately. Second, if a third village tile becomes haunted at any point, the game ends immediately. Third, if the ghost deck runs out while the incarnation of Wu Fang is still active, the game ends immediately as well. As for Wu Fang, that brings us on to how you win. Remember during game setup when we put the orange card into the ghost deck? That was an incarnation of Wu Fang, who represents Ghost Story's final boss. Destroy the incarnation of Wu Fang and you win the game. As you progress through the game and drawing ghost cards, you will eventually come upon the Wu Fang card. In our case, it's the 46th ghost card. Wu Fang cards represent an extraordinary threat. They are much tougher than normal ghosts and follow some special rules. First, Wu Fang cards cannot be destroyed with Buddha traps or through the use of the Sorcerer's Hut tile. You've got to beat them by attempting an exorcism and rolling the die. Secondly, some incarnations of Wu Fang require you to roll the cursed die when you destroy them. You must suffer any effects of the cursed die before winning the game. For instance, if there were only one player left and the result of the cursed die caused him to discard his last chi token, the game would be lost. However, deal with Wu Fang and any of his nasty effects and the victory will be yours. Congrats, you've earned it. This concludes our overview of Ghost Stories. As mentioned before, we've been playing a setup for four players on the initiation difficulty level. However, this game supports between one and four players on various difficulty levels. Here's a quick explanation. Check the rulebook for full details. So, with less than four players, there are two important changes. First, ghost X size decreases with less players. You use 50 ghosts for three players, 45 ghosts for two players, and 44 solo play. Also, in solo play only, the single player receives a single DAO token of each color, and the red player board should be set to the Dance of the Peaks flying ability. Secondly, player boards will still be placed for all four spots. Boards without players are considered neutral game boards and receive three chi tokens only. Should they lose these three tokens, their boards will become possessed and cannot be returned to its normal state by any means. Neutral boards are still considered in play, and the normal ghost placement rules still apply. When during the clockwise order of play you come to a neutral board, the first two steps of the yin phase for that imaginary player will still occur. The ability of the ghost on the neutral board will still trigger during the turn of the imaginary vacant player, just as they would during the yin phase of a normal player. Hauntings, cursed die rolls, and so forth will still happen as normal. However, and this is important, neutral boards disregard the third part of their yin phase in which they would draw a ghost card. Again, simply put, neutral boards never draw a ghost card during their imaginary turn. Also, when playing with less than four, each real player will receive a neutral power token. An active player may use a neutral power token during his turn to activate the special power of any non-possessed neutral board. This is in addition to any other actions during his turn. Once used, the token is placed on the center tile and can be picked up on the following turns by any player occupying said tile. Players may take all or part of the tokens on this tile. If a player dies, his power token goes back to the central tile. As for additional difficulty levels, there are slight changes in the amount of resources you receive during setup. The two hardest levels also add some additional conditions for winning the game. Please check the rulebook for full details. So that about wraps it up. Now, as we've mentioned, this is a tough one, and we'd like to offer some strategies to help new players come to grips with the game. That being said, if you don't prefer any spoilers, tips, or advice of the kind, go ahead and shut off the video now. We respect your bravery and wish you luck, Grasshopper. But if you need some Mr. Miyagi schooling, stick around and we'll get you right with the wax on, wax off of ghost stories. Okay, some quick tips for aspiring Sun Tzu's. First up, in the midst of chaos, there is also opportunity. Don't forget about your Taoist special power. You should be using it pretty much every turn. Get every benefit on your side that you can because you will need it. Certain special powers group better with others. Although it's not strictly kosher with the rules, you might want to choose which ones you use during your first game. Secondly, those who wish to fight must first count the cost. Be careful of the ghost removal abilities. Try to let players who can afford to take the cursed die roll defeat the ghost who caused that condition. Be careful about taking on a cursing ghost with a handful of Dao tokens in your inventory. You may lose them all. 
Third, the greatest victory is that which requires no battle. Not every ghost needs to be dealt with. For example, say you've got a haunter figuring down, but the haunter ghost has been destroyed. Stick a non-haunter ghost in that free spot and it will keep the haunter figurine from moving. Otherwise, you will get too many hauntings and that will end the game. We hope you enjoy ghost stories and invite you to leave any questions or comments you may have below. You can also hit us up on Twitter for further rules explanations. We'll do the best we can. Thanks for watching and take it easy.